Last week we talked about uh, how fractals and, fractals and Fibonacci sequences and how nature expresses itself through uh, mathematics and we did uh, uh, we drew some of the uh, fractals uh, and the golden ratio on the graph paper. Then second week we talked about platonic solids and Archimedean solids mm -hmm. and we actually, many of you, we actually built solids either with the sticks uh, and marshmallows or, or with the paper, right? And last week uh, we talked about the story of pi. You guys, and you guys remember the Eratosthenes, how he measured the circumference of the earth uh, more than 2000 years back. So this week, now if you realize, every week we are talking about different topics. So this is not like a typical math class. So don't. Uh, so I want you to be aware of that uh, when you come here. Oh, why are we doing different things, right? Because this class is more, this is not really a class. First of all, this is more of a fun. Remember what we said in the first week? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This class is all about fun, but don't tell your parents. Okay. Remember you remember it was that. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want you to really appreciate the bigger picture of math. When you do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, fractions, and some of you might be learning some of the early parts of pre algebra and algebra, right? We do all those procedures, it's important that you learn those. But at the same time, math, as invented by uh, many mathematicians before us, uh, there's a bigger, first of all, there are a lot of interesting stories. As we have seen some of the stories, last week's Erdosan story, right? We have, there are a lot more interesting stories. We'll, we'll talk about some of them today again. But also, uh, when you talk about advanced math topics, some of them, if you, when you just do the procedure, you'd wonder why are we doing this, it looks confusing. But if you understand what is the purpose of each of those subjects, and we are going to talk about three particular math topics today, and we'll so this in this program I want to give you the bigger picture of what each of those subjects really means. What is the history behind them? How was it invented? Who are the people involved? What are the stories behind them? But also, what are they trying to do at a big picture? At uh, so that when you reach that level, and some of this you are not going to learn until like several years later, but when you reach that level, you are curious about it, you want to learn about it, and you also understand why you are doing this, okay? That's the real purpose, okay? With that, I'll start with a topic uh, called, uh, one way to look at math is, we are really trying to model the real world on paper. What do I mean by that? Let's say, uh, let's say, remember your uh, preschool uh, math class, okay? Uh, probably, it's a long time ago, some of you probably, you know, remember just the fun that you had, not much math, but, uh, so if the teacher wanted to show you that there are three, a group of, in a basket there are three apples, okay? Apple one, Apple 2 and Apple 3. Okay? In another basket, there are two more apples. Apple 1 and Apple 2. If you put both of these together, total how many apples are there? Five. 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 Easy, right? No. It's, it looks very easy now, but when you are in preschool, you somebody had to teach you, right? Or you take three fingers. One, two, three. One, two. Okay, how many is that? One, two, three, four, five. Right? Remember those days? Yeah. Now you laugh at it, but we all went through it, right? <laughs> right? We all went through that. Now, this is you call a way to model the real life. Because if you really want to count apples, take three apples here, two apples here, actually bring them together, one, two, three, four, five. While it might be fun, every time if you have to do that, it's time consuming. The teacher has to go get apples, or if you want to compare monkey, you add three monkeys and two monkeys, you get five monkeys, it's difficult to get five monkeys together in the class. Or <laughs> some, sometimes, sometimes usually some of you, considering you, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, so this is called mathematical modeling, or 
But also, we also call it, it's a way to abstract the real world into some, uh, some on the paper, right? <coughs> so, have you uh, ever heard the word, uh, word uh, abstraction? What does abstraction uh, mean? What do you think? Something that many people think is different, like, like, like if you create something that for some people it might seem like one thing, but for other people it might seem like something. Right, okay. Any, any other, uh, what do we think of uh, what an abstraction is? So, you talk about apple, showing the actual apple is reality, right? Apple, you, but when I say this circle represents apple, this is not really apple, I'm just saying. Think of this as an apple, right? So that's an abstraction. An abstraction means you take a concrete object like an apple or a monkey or anything and represent it with a picture. Okay? This is one level of abstraction. But after some time, you don't stop here. Your teacher, when maybe you go to kindergarten, uh, first grade, they will uh, say, uh, take three plus add two and 3 plus 2 is 5. Okay? So after some time they will stop giving you this picture, they directly give the numbers. Okay? Why do you think the teacher did not start immediately with this and first started with this pictures 1, 2, 3, 1, 2 and then and the, but put 5 symbols here and only later did this. Why not they start with this? Seriously? Because um, if you think like if you think like um, it's easier for it to have something like have a picture so that then um, it will be easier for you to learn because easier to visualize yeah, and to think about it. Excellent answer. Yes, Bashir. Well, since there were little kids, they might think that the three is just one number and the two is one number, and they would have the answers too. So when they're little, they would count each one and then say it as five. Exactly. Perfect. So when you're small, it's much, say one, two, three, four, five. It's easy to count that way. To think that this something that we wrote a symbol represents actually three things, and this symbol represents two things, and hence you put together the entire things represent five, is a hard concept when you're small. The same thing would have happened in the ancient days when nobody told them the numbers existing, right? Because there are no books, there are no schools, people just... Remember we talked about the early ancient human beings, maybe hunter-gatherers, there was no math, right? They figured out their own math. And at that time, remember we talked about they used to count things by pebbles, by stones, mm -hmm. right? A stone is a way of abstracting the reality. Instead of showing five, three apples and two apples, probably they put three stones here, two stones here, together that makes five stones, right? So, and from there we went to this. And this was easy for them. After some time, right, as they did many times, some of those smart folks among them, ancient human beings, they would have figured out truth. It is easier to put a one symbol for three things, one symbol for five things, and one another symbol for eight things. So that I don't have to, if I have to show hundred things, I don't need to put hundred papers and count them every time, I can write one number, right? So they figured that one, and that's how numbers evolve over a period of time. But we said this is an abstraction of reality because this is not really apple itself; it's picture. This is a second level of abstraction. Going from this picture to actual number today, it might look easy for you because you do it so many times. But think about the people who actually figured it first time. It would have taken hundreds or even thousands of years to reach this one symbol represent three things or this another symbol represents five things this another symbol represents th a thousand things it would have taken many thousands of years to figure that out right same thing with the sp small kids right when they uh, initially they show them apple this is apple but after some time say oh this picture represents an apple then the three pictures represent three apples and they get there after a year or two years we slowly teach them numbers Right? This is a level of another level of abstraction from here to here, right? As we grow, we think more and more abstractly. Your mind is tuned to think more abstractly. Now, why is 
Why do we do that? Why do we go to higher level of abstraction? Why don't we just stay here? Why do we go here? What do you think this introduces? Yes? It's like roughly always like draw pictures or something. Like if it's like a really, really big number, uh, that would be so hard to like draw all those or like take that many things and put it. Perfect answer. Because we have just, uh, just like uh, uh, Pranay, right? Pranay said, if you have a thousand things, <coughs> write thousand pictures. That's going to take a long time. Instead, you just can just write thousand. This is more efficient, this is more effective, this is faster, right? So higher levels of abstraction are faster to do. And we can solve bigger problems, more complex problems. If we always stay here, we can never solve bigger problems in life, bigger problems in the world, right? That's why we go to higher levels of abstraction, okay? So, but as we go to higher levels of abstraction, it's harder to learn also, okay? Now, from this level of abstraction, over a period of time, mathematicians figured that, look, probably we need one more level of abstraction. Because the problems that you are trying to solve as they become tougher and tougher, you need to think more abstractly. Right? Because we just saw, we went from here to here, it, uh, we had to go to a higher level of abstraction, made it faster. So what is the next level? Next thing they figured out is, let's say, I know that there are three things here. I also know that there are five things here. But I don't know how many things are here, so they put a symbol. Let's say you put a triangle. Okay, some symbol, doesn't matter. This is an unknown thing. This is a tougher problem than this. No, it may not look much tough to you now, because you're already, you know, for, for six days, and uh, you did this earlier, but, Remember your preschool days, or PK days, or kindergarten days? This will be hard to figure what it is, to think that, oh, this is, this is just opposite of subtraction, so I can subtract 5 minus 3 to get this. It's not an easy thing when you are learning for the first time. If you have an end sibling, a brother or sister who is in pre-K, you, you would think, you would realize how hard it is for the first time to figure out. What if they give it the first time, next, next time it is easy? This is a higher level of abstraction than this, right? Why? Because from here to here, went from one level of symbols to another level of symbols, and one symbol representing three things. But here, what we are doing, we are replacing, see this is purely numbers. Now from numbers, we are going to symbols. Okay, that's a little bit harder again. Okay? Now, this kind of thinking, this level of abstraction, is beginning of what we call algebra, okay? Sometimes, and some of you probably started learning a little bit of algebra, but most of you don't do much algebra yet. And sometimes you think, algebra looks so hard, it has all those x's and y's and all those things, right? Don't worry, that's not true. Algebra is not x's and y's. Algebra is a way of thinking. Algebra, all that means is that figuring out unknowns, okay? Figuring out unknowns by balancing two sides. You have one side here, one other side here, balance those two things and figure out the unknown. That's all of the price. Okay? Now, obviously, you won't stop here, right? You want to start solve bigger and bigger problems. So, there are, there are higher levels of algebra, but at the core, algebra is all that it is. Balancing two sides and figuring out an unknown thing. Let me give you an example, okay, of algebra and thinking. If I say that, uh, in a form, there's some animals, okay? Uh, let's say there are uh, pigs and chickens, okay? And together, there are, let's say, 45 pigs and chickens together. And we don't know how many are pigs, how many are chickens, okay? But we do know that there are a total of, let's say, 118 legs. Okay, remember, pigs have four legs, chickens have two legs each. Now, question is, how many pigs are there, how many chickens are there? Now, that problem is a little harder problem than this, right? To do that, what, what is, what, what is miss, we have some unknowns. There would be multiple answers for that. Okay, maybe there are. 
I'm not so much interested in, in the answer. How, my question is, how would you approach to solve that problem? Yes, Bhavashin? You could make a chart having pigs on one side and chickens on one side and do like one pig, one chicken, one Perfect. So one way to do that is number of pigs, number of chickens, okay, and not total number of legs, okay? And we said total there are how many? 40? Yeah. No, 118. 118 legs. And how many uh, how many total animals did they say? 45. 45? 45 total animals. So you can think that oh, I need total 45. Let's say, so I assume that there's one pig and it means 44 chickens, right? That would be how much? 44 times 288. 88 plus 44 is 92. Well, that's less than 118, so we need more pigs, right? Because every pig has two more legs than chickens. So again, we need 45. Let's increase to two pigs and 43 chickens. So the total of 45. Now, it will be 86 plus uh, 8, which is equal to? 94. 94. Hey, they went up by 2, but they're still less than 118. You can keep going increasing one by at a time. Or you think a little bit more abstractly, a little bit more algebraically, you would say. You can see that uh, maybe let's go one more. 45, the three pigs and 44, sorry, 42 chickens, that will be 84 plus 12, which is 96. What is happening? Every time you, you replace one of the chickens by uh, one of the pigs, the number of legs is increasing by two, which makes sense because each pig has two more legs than each chicken. So, you can see that, look, 96 is how much smaller than 118? 22. 22. 22. So, 118 minus 96 is 22. So, that means that every time you replace a chicken by a pig, two, you're getting two more legs, so divide by two. So, perhaps we need 11 more pigs. What is 11 plus 3? 14. 14. If you have, if you have 14 pigs should have 11 less than this which 31. is uh, 31 okay let's verify whether this is working 14 times 4 is how much 56 and 31 times 2 is 16 and add them voila we got 118 legs that's what we are looking for so there are 14 pigs and 31 chickens that's algebraic thinking what did, we, what did we just do? We solved the problem. We solved a problem to find some unknown unknown things. Okay. Right? That's all that we did. Now to come to this level of math, now because we, you are taught this way, it might may not have looked that hard, but it took a long time for human beings to figure this out. The story of how human beings figured this out is a very, very interesting one. Okay? So I'm going to take you the, through that story. Now, thinking of algebraically, well, the word algebra came much later. So, to say that the ancient human beings thinking algebraically is kind of what is called anachronistic. You know what is anachronis anachronism? No. Anachronism is like, let's say, uh, you are watching a, a film, a movie uh, of the Civil War. Okay? So the Civil War happened in the 1860s. In the middle of civil war, American civil war, if you see an aeroplane, <laughs> right? that is an anachronism. Why? Because the aeroplane was not invented by then. So, talking about algebra in ancient days, and let's say ancient Greek time or ancient Indian or Egyptian or Mesopotamian times, is an anachronism because the word algebra did not come. But let's say we are we're not talking about the term, but we're talking about the idea, okay, of uh, algebraic thinking, okay, that was found in actually many ancient uh, civilizations by archaeologists. There, uh, we have some uh, evidence from some of the Egyptian papyrus. There's one particular papyrus called uh, Rind, a Rind papyrus, which actually has many problems which we can call as algebraic thinking. Although it does not have all the components of what we today call as algebra, but it has 
elements of algebraic thinking. In some of the Babylonian uh, <coughs> clay, clay tablets, called cuneiform uh, tablets, they have some evidence of that. And certainly many Indian uh, mathematicians, Indian scholars, we can, because they don't just do mathematics, because in those days there are no specialization in mathematicians. They're just scholars who are studying things. Uh, they wrote many books in which there are evidence of uh, algebraic thinking. One particular one, uh, this is a very advanced one actually, uh, by uh, an Indian scholar called Brahma Gupta. He wrote a book in the 17th century AD. Uh, there's a long name. It's called Brahma Sfuta Siddhanta. In that book, he has several examples of very complex what colors algebra problems today. One thing though, the algebraic notation that we talked about, x's and y's and squares and square roots and all those, they were not there at the time. So everything was described in words. It's a very long one. You will have one paragraph for one or sometimes one page to describe one problem because everything is in words. Okay? Now, he wrote in Sanskrit, similarly, there are many Greek scholars, ancient Greek scholars, who use it. There's particularly one Greek scholar called Diophantus. Uh, whom we are going to revisit again in the next class when we talk about Fermat's last theorem. Um, he wrote a book called Arithmetic, Arithmetica. Now, don't be fooled by the word Arithmetica because Arithmetica like, like, sounds like arithmetic, which means addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. He called it Arithmetica, in which he has a many algebraic problems. Okay? But uh, most mathematicians today agree that. Uh, The birth of algebra, what we call today's modern algebra, probably started with a book. Uh, although, uh, okay, with a particular book written by one particular Arab scholar. Now, remember we talked about Arabs had a lot of interactions with Indians. And especially when Europe was going through the Middle Ages, that we talked about the Dark Ages between 5th century and 12th or 13th century, China, India, and Arab worlds went through great cultural revolution. They actually did a lot of mathematical, scientific, astronomic innovations. And as part of that, uh, we talked about how uh, many Indian mathematicians, uh, including Aryabhatta, Brahmagupta, etc., uh, and some of the even predecessors to them, uh, invented today's <coughs> system that we use today. And that comes from Indian scholars to the Arab scholars, which went eventually later, Europeans learned during the 12th, 13th centuries and during the Renaissance, and they expanded it further, right? We talked about those stories. Uh, one of those very interesting stories is this particular person, his name is, let me erase this, Al Khwarizmi. Anybody heard the name Al Khwarizmi? Mm -hmm. Okay. There's very little chance that any of you heard this name earlier, but he's, a, he's probably one of the great mathematical figures uh, in the history. Unfortunately, you know, in the, in the school and most places we don't learn those things, and that's why I want to give you, uh, want you to appreciate the history of mathematics. So this particular person, Al Khwarizmi. Okay. He wrote uh, a very important book, mathematical book, which is probably the, one of the greatest mathematical books today, uh, or ever. Uh, the name of the book is a very long one, it is in Arab, so you won't understand, but I will translate. The name of the book is called Al Kitab Al Muttasar Fi Hisab Al Jabar Wal Muqabala. When you translate it into English, it's like the compendious book on calculation by, by completion and balancing. That's, even that's probably hard. Mm -hmm. The compendious means compilation. Basically, it's a book of problems of calculation by completion and balancing. I'll explain what it is in a second. But I'll, I'll read the book one more time. The interesting thing is the name algebra came because of this book title. I'll read the title one more time and I want you to identify which word <coughs> in this title might have led to this name Algebra. Okay? Listen to carefully. Al-Kitab. Kitab, by the way, anybody who knows Hindi, 
would realize that uh, because Arabs and Indians had a lot of interactions, right? So there are many words common. Kitab in Hindi means book, the same thing here as in Arab. Al Kitab, Al Muqtasar, Fi Hisar, Al Jabbar, Wal Makabra. Which word do you think led to algebra? Algebra. Algebra, which meant really, uh, I think all the words is based balancing. Okay, okay the name of the book said is the, the book in English translation is the book on calculation by completion and balancing. The algebra, which is actually a Arab word, okay, when um, Europeans started trading with Arabs, especially Italians. If you look at the uh, map of the world, especially Europe, uh, the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, and the uh, and the uh, Arab uh, Asia and Africa. Did anybody remember how it looks like? It kind of, it's a kind of like a shoe going into uh, like a boot going into the Mediterranean Sea, right? And then other side is Asia and Africa. So Italians had a lot of trade using ships, small ships and boats going to the Arabs. And when they go there, the, the primary interest is trading. Maybe, you know, sell what they have <coughs> in Italy and buy what is available in Arab. But when they go there, they need to learn some local. And sometimes, and when you go there, you don't come back same day. You don't have speed boats and big ships. They go there for, they stay there for a month, they find what they want, and they come back. And some of them stay there for years. And we talked about one particular person in the first class, right? Do you remember any Italian? A trader who went and brought something back? Yes. Marco Polo. Marco Polo. <laughs> Marco Polo. We did not talk about him. He went to other parts of the world. But we talked about somebody who went to Arab world and came back. We Leonardo Pisa. Leonardo Pisa. Who we also call him Fibonacci. Right? He's one of them. So there are many such traders, uh, scholars, who went to Arab and studied Arab, Arab way of thinking and bring it back. And some of them went and read this book because they learned Arab, by the way, and because they already know Latin, which was the predominant language in Europe in those days. We're talking about 12th, 12th, Greek. Hmm? I thought Greek speak Latin. Greek speak Latin? Yeah. So, okay. So, if you remember, if you go back to the timeline that we talked about, the Greeks, uh, Europe, the Greeks dominated Europe up to until 2nd century BC. Okay, that's about 2300 years back. Between about 8th century BC to 2nd century BC. Sorry, if you want to talk, raise your hand. Okay, because if we both talk, nobody can understand anything. So, Greeks, ancient Greeks, classic period is up to probably until 2nd century BC. Then between about 2nd century, century BC to about 5th, 5th century AD, Romans, who defeated Greeks, were the greatest was in uh, Europe. At that time, until then, Greek probably was the predominant language. But when the Romans conquered Europe, the predominant language in Europe was Latin. It stayed there until uh, probably 16th, 17th centuries. Then other languages came. Eventually, Britain became a very strong force in Europe and in the <coughs> world, and then English became a more predominant language. But at this time, around 12th or 13th century BC, sorry, AD, Latin was the predominant language in Europe. So they translated this book and many other books into Latin. So other Europeans started reading. And obviously, this long name is hard, so they, they put it in uh, English words. While doing that, they converted some of the words and they coined new words. That's how the word algebra came from. It is an Arabic word which kind of, you know, when you move from one, when you take some word and take it to another language, Kinds of mutilated and changed a little bit. That's how we algebra came. Okay. Interestingly, the Al Khwarizmi, the name Al Khwarizmi, who is a mathematician or a scholar, his name also was uh, actually initially became a word in English. Can anybody guess what could be that word? It's a mathematical word. It's hard to guess because it changed so much that it. It looks less, somewhat different, but after I tell, you can see the correlation. But it's um, calculus. It's not. It did not change that much. It starts with uh, still a. Uh, 
But after that, it changes. Algorithm? You got it. It's called actually algorithm. Anybody heard the word algorithm? Yes. Okay. What does algorithm mean? Good job, Sri. What is the algorithm in mathematics is a kind of procedure through which you can solve certain problems. Okay? You learn more when you do computers in algorithms are very common. Okay? The word algorithm came from actually all queries which name. Okay, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So uh, but coming back to algebra, what all queries we did in this book is he said, and it's very good actually way to learn algebra. But I think if you keep this picture, you will probably uh, remove a lot of doubts about algebra and get the big picture of algebra. Think of a balance, a scale, okay? So if I draw a scale, and I'm not very good at drawing pictures, but let's say this one, okay? If you think of a scale like this, <coughs> okay? You put two things here and two things here, the balance, okay? This is kind of balancing each other. What he said is that if you want to solve any problem with some unknowns, let's go back to our, the problem that we started. 3 plus some unknown equals 5, okay? So this 3 plus unknown is on this side and 5 is on this side. Our goal is to find unknowns, just like the chicken and uh, uh, pigs problem that we talked about, right? You want to balance two things, and it's like a balance uh, scale, balance scale in which both sides should be equal to each other. And to solve, to find the unknown thing, okay, go back to the name of the book. It's very interesting. The name is very important because the name almost represents what we do. It says the book, it says compendious book, but it's really compilation. So I'll just call it the book on calculation. Everybody knows what is calculation, right? Calculation by completion and balancing. And let's see the keywords are completion and balancing. Okay? So if you look this 3 plus unknown equal to 5. Okay, I'll take an easier example. We can make it harder examples. But if you understand the concept of easier example, you know that the bigger problem is just a more complex version of this. Right? 3 plus unknown equals 5. He said, this should always remain balanced, but you have to complete. And to complete it, you can complete it in such a way that whatever you are doing on one side, you have to do the same on the other side. If you add one weight here and add one more weight here, equal weights, they will still balance it, right? If you take away one weight here and take away one weight here, they are still balanced. So, keep all unknowns on one side. To complete it, keep all unknowns on one side, the known things move to the other side. So there's a 3 here, so if you subtract 3 on both sides, what happens? This 3 is become 0, so you only have the unknown thing here. Now 5 minus 3 is 2, two. and hence the unknown equal to 2. It might look obvious, right, because it's a small problem, you can take a much more complex problem, but you exactly do that. You complete, but keep them always balanced. And you can solve even very complex unknown things. That's all really algebra is. Now obviously it's not all, <laughs> you can com there are more complex problems, but that is the essence, that's the bottom line of algebra. Okay? And that did not change until today. But what changed is when our quality is doing and uh, before him and a little later after, all of these are solved through words. Every problem is completely described in words. Okay? So to solve this, I would say, uh, <coughs> today we call the unknown thing as x, right? Uh, if you are introduced to algebra. Okay, otherwise if you don't, you will learn in the next one, two years. But uh, they used to call unknown thing as unknown thing. So I have five unknown things, add those five unknown things to seven known things and multiply the whole thing by 18 and that divide, uh, uh, subtract from that 9 and that balances with 32. What is the value of the unknown thing? 
Uh, that's the which I have to do that to balance it, to complete it in balance, they do most of the time. Or to do that, the ninth thing that I am subtracting, I will add on both sides so that my left side 9, the 9 subtracted 9 is gone. See how difficult it is? But that's how they did. But, at, but the concept is the same. But what happened later was, as the Europeans started learning this, they allowed this, by the way. Oh, until then, the predominant mathematics, in fact, the only mathematics, in, apart from basic algebra, like addition, sub, sub, basic arithmetic, like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, the predominant mathematics in Europe was geometry. The reason was, Greeks had a lot of bias towards geometry, for whatever reason, they loved geometry. So, in fact, every math that they did, it was geometry. If you look at the first few lectures, we talked more about geometry, right? When we talk about platonic solids, or, uh, uh, or the Archimedean circles, and all. So, mostly geometry, uh, and all the problems that they expressed in geometry, they thought all math problems have to be solved in geometry, clearly, because Geometry is intuitive, it's pictures, as opposed to algebra, which is more, ab more abstract, right? More conceptual, where as a, uh, but geometry is more intuitive. And that continued to Romans and all the European, what we call as universities today, but they're like religious institutions in those days. They also used to teach math, but all of them are based on geometry, which, what were the books? Euclid's elements. We talked about 13 books that Euclid wrote uh, more than 2000 years back. Those were the standard textbooks in all European universities until as late as 15th and 16th centuries. So when this concept of algebra moved from uh, Indian and Arab world to Europe, all Europeans are just following geometry, but they loved this concept. Because this is, you can solve a lot more complex problems much more faster than what you can do with geometry. And people started uh, translating them, more books, and understanding more, but they also developed more complex algebra on top of what Arabs had done, or compared to anybody had done. But that also led to some interesting things. Now, in those days, there were no TVs. In the Greek, so what do you think is the major entertainment? If you go to the Greek days and Roman days, especially Roman days, they have gladiators. Right? That was a major entertainment. So they used to have the huge public halls where the idea of fights go on and they're dangerous, but it is entertainment for a lot of people. Right? But by the time 12th and 13th centuries came, the idea gone. Roman times were gone. So they used to have uh, public squares in the cities and they used to have some kind of competitions. And around this time, when these algebraic problems moved from Arab world to Europe, Especially Italians, some in some Italian cities, they ha started having mathematical contests. So whoever wins this math competition is going to win a prize. They might even get some jobs. The kings have used to patronize some of the you know, intelligent people, those who can solve hard math problems. They used to probably get a you know, teacher, a professor at a university uh, or a king's court or whatever. So people used to study algebra <coughs> and these math problems to go to this contest, try to win. And one such contest was extremely interesting. Okay? This is between uh, this gentleman called Tartalian, who uh, learned how to solve a certain set of algebraic problems. The complex set, set of problems called, these called cubic equations. These are harder than 3 plus uh, half known equal to 5. The general form, of a, a cubic equation looks like this. And if you don't understand, go for it. Okay? Because it's way at once for you. So, I don't expect you to completely understand or solve it, but just appreciate it. This is called a cubic equation. It looks like this. Ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d equals 0. That's called a cubic equation because the highest power of x is cube here. That's what we call a cubic equation. Okay. Now, in those days, in fact, starting all the way back to 
ancient, uh, some of the ancient Indian and uh, Greek scholars, they solved some specific cubic problems. In fact, the Greek catapults, you heard about the Greek, Greek catapults? Uh, Archimedes designed some of them to uh, keep Romans at bay uh, when they are trying to occupy the Greek, uh, Greek city of Syracuse. Syracuse. And uh, the catapult was built using uh, uh, the strength that you need for a catapult to you know, throw things is based on a cubic equation. So many ancient mathematicians did solve specific cubic equation. What I mean by specific cubic equation is something like x cubed and where this b equal to 0, a equal to 1, b equal to 0, x cubed, let's say, I don't know, minus 2x plus 5 equal to 0. Okay, something like that is called a specific cubic equation. And they had actual solutions for these kind of problems. Although, they're not called with this notation because this notation did not get introduced until about 15th, 16th, 17th centuries in Europe. These were all expressed in words, but specific problems like that were solved. But what nobody knew was, if you take any cubic equation of, with any values given to A, B, C, and D, how to solve it? Nobody knew at that time. But there was a, a Tata, there's a person called Tartaglia who was going to this contest. He never told anybody his secrets, but he was able to solve these problems quickly. So he was winning all the prizes. In fact, there was another person before him uh, who solved a solution, a general solution for what is known as a, known as a depressed uh, cubic equation where the x squared thing is zero but everything else you can take any other things. He found that so he was winning but Tartaglia figured the, a general solution for any cubic equation and he was setting those questions and he was winning. But something interesting happened. Then another interesting character called Cardano, all this was in 13th century, uh, no this is actually by the time 1500s Italy. Uh, when uh, another interesting word, Cardano, is a very, very colorful figure. We will revisit him in another topic in a, uh, later today in a class. But he, he talked to Tartaglia to telling him the solution. Tartaglia initially did not want to tell, but he said, he promised, he probably signed a contract. He said, I will never reveal to anyone. And uh, instead of let me tell you the story, let, let's watch the story. It's a very interesting story, okay? Mm -hmm. Pay attention to this. Uh, this is Tartaglia and uh, the times around Italy, in the, around this time. And, uh, watch this carefully. Very interesting story. Once upon a time, during the Renaissance, the 1500s, in Italy, mathematicians would hold public competitions during which they would challenge each other to solve problems. Those who won these competitions were renowned and could easily find employment. Therefore, mathematicians kept their knowledge secret in order to have an advantage in competition. This brings us to the kind of problem that was common during the period. It involves solving cubic equations, that is, equations of the form ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d equals zero. Many mathematicians believe there was no general solution to this equation. This brings us to Scipio del Ferro who studied at the University of Bologna. There he solved what is called the depressed cubic. Equations of this form. The square time is zero. Of course, he kept his solution secret. But on his deathbed, Del Ferro divulged the formula to his student, Antonio Fiore. Because of this formula, Fiore excelled in competitions, solving depressed cubics. When another mathematician, Niccolo Tartaglia, claimed to be more adept at solving these kinds of problems, 
Fiori did not believe. So Fiori challenged Tartaglia to a public competition. Nothing like an arm wrestling match, but a competition of wits. The two gave each other math problems to solve. Tartaglia gave Fiori cubic equations that couldn't be solved with the solution Del Ferro told him. Since Tartaglia had figured out, on his own, a solution to the general depressed cubic equation, he easily won the competition. Fiori was disgraced because of his loss, and he ran away, disappearing. Now, Girolamo Cardano came into the story. He was not the best role model for mathematicians today. In life, he was somewhat of a rat. Or a scoundrel. Impressed and intrigued with Tartaglia's ability to solve these equations, Cardano asked Tartaglia to share the solution with him. Tartaglia refused, guarding his secret. However, Cardano persisted until Tartaglia was willing to share, as long as Cardano promised never to publish the formula. And to never write it down, except in code. Tartaglia created a contract, and Cardano signed it, promising not to share the solution. With the solution, Cardano was able to find two other solutions but could not publish them because they used Tartaglia's formula. Cardano grew restless waiting for Tartaglia to publish his solution so he could publish his without breaking the contract. After hearing a rumor that Tartaglia was not the first to find the formula for the cubic equation, Cardano investigated. He found evidence of Scipione del Ferro's original solution and decided that the contract he signed was no longer valid. Cardano published Ars Magna with Tartaglia's solution included. Tartaglia was furious with Cardano and spent the rest of his life trying to discredit Cardano. Despite his great accomplishment with the cubic equation, Tartaglia died poor and with little fame. Now, who says math isn't exciting? Isn't that an interesting story? Yeah, yeah who said math is boring, right? Is it, is it... So it has a lot of exciting stories. Now, isn't this better than uh, if you open the TV, all those fights that you get from, you know, on the silly things. It's better to fight about math than silly things, right? Mm. Uh, although, he dramatized a little bit, probably Cardano is not that bad, but he did take away Card uh, Tartaria's bread and butter <laughs> by by taking a secret but publishing it openly. Now everybody knows, knows the secret, so Tartaglia can't win anymore because everybody knows how to solve it, right? Cardano, as I said, is a very interesting thing. We will come back in another math topic we're going to talk later on today. Uh, but the public contest like this made algebra very, very popular in Europe. So that's the point. Yes, Steve? But did Cardano get there since he published the book? He probably did. In fact, he got uh, more popular, not just popular. See, they, remember, these are their livelihoods. This is how they made money. This is how that their profession. So Tartaria lost it. But Cardano also did not make money, a lot of money from public contest because, based on this because he gave it away. But he made money from his books. But Later down, he moved on to another game where he made a lot more money. We'll, we'll revisit that story in a, uh, a little later. Using another math. So he was involved in two major inventions of math. One is algebra. Although he's not involved in the invention, he's made more popularized it. But he was in another math topic. He actually was one of the pioneers in that. Although he looked at more to make money out of it, but in the process, he actually have to create a new math, math subject altogether, which is, a, which is so important today in financial world, in stock markets, in business, risk management, etc. It's very important. So we'll come to that in a minute. But the point from this is that made algebra very really popular. 
so unlike in India and Arab world in China where although they actually had head start compared to Europe which was kind of in the dark until what they call as renaissance until 12, 13, 14, 15 centuries uh, in India, Arab world and uh, China there are actually, they, they made a lot more advances than Europe in those days but they stayed with, the knowledge stayed with just a few people it never became popular so eventually they lost the edge, whereas Europeans, once they learned it, they, they, they documented it, they made it easier to follow, and they made, made it more popular, and more and more people started learning, and hence developed more advanced techniques, and hence eventually that led to what we call as Renaissance and, and modern science and modern mathematics, most of it came out of Europe, right? And they also obviously developed better weaponry, to colonize the rest of the world and uh, and but advance the science and math as well in the process. So as algebra become more and more and more popular in Europe, uh, they thought this kind of words based problem and and these notations still not there when Cardano and Tata we are fighting. They are still doing kind of words and maybe some notation. Okay? This notation really became popular uh, from 16th, 17th centuries in Europe. They figured that look, this, if you want to really use math for advanced science or on a day to day basis, it is hard to be, deal with just words, just like I talked about earlier, right? Take five unknown things plus add eight known things and multiply with seven, subtract eight, and that equals 15 unknown things. Now find unknown thing, that's very hard. So then they started coming with notation. So okay, let's call the unknown thing as x. Uh, all the known uh, things with the numbers, right? Something like this. And if you are multiplying this with, you just put that number times this. And you can also have squared terms. So if it is, uh, you can call it two x squared. And you can have cubic. This is called a quadratic equation. And because it's an equation, by the way, this balance is replaced by equal sign. You call it equal, right? You, would have, you might have figured that out. If you take the two if you look at the two sides, this is this is like the the equal sign is like the uh, like the uh, uh, like the balance in the scale, and this is equal to whatever nine. Okay, and this is called quadratic equation because the highest power is our exponent is two. You can have a cubic equation like an x cube. Then you can call a quadratic equation called x four, etc. Then by putting these notations, x, s, y, s, squares, because this square is an, is, a, is an innovation. And before that, if you want to write two unknown things, you have to times, you have to write unknown times unknown. And unknown multiply itself by itself. Okay? That's a long way to write it, right? You replace that with x, unknown is x, because multiply it with the square. If you want to write a cube, cube, right? You have to multiply itself by three times. It takes a long time, right? You can just call x cube. All this innovation happened in Europe later. And some one of the uh, uh, one of the most important figures who contributed to this, there's several, uh, but one of the most one is a, a person called Rene Descartes. Uh, he's actually a French gentleman. So you know the French names in, when you put it in English, they, they sound different from the way the spelling. His spelling is actually D E S C A R T E S. If you ask somebody how do you how do you pronounce that, just based on the letters uh, upper name, Pradhi, how would you pronounce that? It sounds like Descartes, right? But it's actually Descartes. The way you pronounce that is Descartes. Descartes. Yeah. But because French pronunciations are different from English. But he's one of the major figures in the Renaissance and in the, in the math development, algebra development. But especially because they're already good at geometry and most of the Europeans think in terms of geometry at the time, what René Descartes did was he applied algebra to geometry. Okay? That gave rise to a new math topic, subject <coughs> called what we call today is analytical geometry. Which essentially means, and you guys will learn this in high school. Okay, in the probably ninth grade or tenth grade, ninth grade. And some of you, if you take advanced subjects, you might even do eighth or seventh grade. 
Analytical geometry just essentially means apply algebraic thinking to geometry, right? Because geometry sometimes how you have to draw pictures, you see, you have to, uh, to prove anything, it takes a long time. If you just express in terms of variables like this equation, it will be much faster. But this is harder. Why? This is more abstract. Where well, geometry is more intuitive, right? It's closer to real, a little bit closer to reality. It's still an abstraction, but this is a higher level of abstraction. It's harder to learn, but once you learn, it's much more efficient. Just like numbers are easier than apples that we're talking about, right? So this is just one more level of abstraction. But as algebra became more and more advanced, some of the European scholars uh, started taking to the next level, asking more questions. And interestingly, just around this time, there's a great progress happening in the in the astronomy field, physics. Uh, because if you remember, we talked about a story. Greeks believed that Earth is in the middle and all the planets, including Sun and Moon, everything moving around Earth, right? And then, uh, who's the gentleman who first said that it is not Earth in the middle, but Sun is in the middle and planet, all planets, including Earth, are moving? Um, no. Copernicus. Nikolai Copernicus. He was the first. Galileo was part of that story, but he came later down. Um, Copernicus probably, he, he published, I think, around 1543, in the mid-16th mid century. When you say 16th century, you say 1500s, right? When you say 21st century, we are talking about 2014, right? Similarly, when you say 16th century, it's 1500. So he published that in his book, uh, literally on his deathbed, on 1543. But later down, uh, others. There's one very pop, uh, very uh, important person in that story is Kepler, Johannes Kepler, who uh, took Copernicus theory to next level. Because Copernicus said that all the planets are moving around the sun, but they are moving in circular orbits at uniform speed. And Copernicus, as Kepler, actually made close observations of all the planets. In fact, his guru. Uh, uh, Tycho Brahe did a lot of observations and from that Kepler took those and he actually mapped that and he figured that look based on these calculations the planets are not moving in circular orbits at uniform speed but they are moving in elliptical orbits you all know what is an ellipse? it is like an elongated circle right? they are moving in elliptical orbits at non-uniform speeds as the planet comes closer, it will go faster, but when it goes farther, it goes slower. Okay? But he did not have a proof for it. He, based on the observation, he came up with a formula, but he did not have a proof. For the proof, one particular gentleman was working hard to prove that in the late, in the mid to late 1600s. And that's when the next greatest math innovation in the entire human history happened. And, uh, but uh, that particular gentleman, you all know all of, all of his name, he's the one who eventually proved the universal theory of gravity. Who is that? Newton. Isaac Newton, right? But to prove that, there's one big challenge. The available math techniques were not sufficient to prove. So to prove it, he actually in, invented a new field of mathematics, which is probably the greatest mathematical innovation ever. Without that, we cannot do advanced science uh, engineering, technology, economics, in every field today that, that is used so much. And that is the field of calculus. How many of you heard calculus? Have you ever heard the word calculus, a math field called calculus? Yeah. Most of you don't know what it is, right? But you know, you heard it, right? Yeah. You probably would go on and what is it. Now, if you are not really ready to understand calculus and how to do it, so I'm not going to teach you how to do it. But you are ready to appreciate what it is and what is the story behind it. So it is an even more interesting story, story than Tartaglia versus Cardano. Because while Newton was in working on this to solve the gravitational theory, at the same time, Newton was in England at the time, this mid-1600s, uh, there is another gentleman uh, called Leibniz who was living in Germany. Uh, he was a German living in Paris at the time. Uh, and he also invented calculus. But apparently independently. 
But then Newton's all the Newton and all his friends said Leibniz copied Newton's stuff. And Leibniz said no, he did it independently, but that was a huge that was the biggest controversy uh, in Europe. Uh, intellectual controversy, math, math or science, kind of, not the physical war. There are a lot of wars going on in Europe, in Europe at the time but, and later, but this was more intellectual, probably the greatest intellectual battle ever. Uh, this is a very interesting story, so watch this video and uh, then we'll come back to what really calculus is, okay? Today, calculus is one of the most important branches of mathematics with applications in science, engineering and economics. But who invented this wonderful tool? As with many questions of invention, the answer is a little complicated. Most mathematicians will tell you that two men deserve the credit for the development of modern calculus, Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz. Of course, Newton and Leibniz were merely the next links in a long chain of discoveries that led to the creation of modern calculus. The ancient Greeks had first dipped their feet into the field, with the famous mathematician Archimedes being the first to find the tangent to a curve, an antiphon of Athens developing the method of exhaustion an early technique to compute the area of a region. Then the Indians added their own discoveries, with the astronomer Aryabhata expressing an astronomical problem in the form of a differential equation in the year 4099, and Parameshvara of Kerala developing an early version of the mean value theorem in the 1500s. Finally, during the European Enlightenment, men like Fermat, Pascal, and Isaac Barrow further pursued the emerging new field, developing the concept of the derivative. Barrow even offered the first proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus, linking the concepts of differentiation and integration. However, it was one of Barrow's young students, a certain Isaac Newton, who would make the next big splash in the creation of the art of calculus. Let's talk a bit about young Isaac for a moment. In his 84 years, Isaac Newton would discover gravity, write the three laws of motion, formulate a modern theory of the origins of colors in the visible spectrum, develop an empirical law of cooling, discover the binomial theorem, kickstart 200 years of intellectual freedom in the Enlightenment, move the British pound to the gold standard, and of course, invent calculus. Newton's rival, Gottfried Leibniz, was no intellectual slouch either. Leibniz developed the binary system that is the basis of all modern electronics, contrived his own theory of everything, the monodology, invented modern formal logic, anticipated the discoveries of Einstein with his metaphysical theory of dynamism, theorized about an early computer to solve algebraic expressions, explored the field now known as topology, created a wonderful brand of German biscuits, and of course, invented calculus. Strangely enough, both men invented calculus, but to their graves, the world believed that only one man was telling the truth. The question was, who? In 1666, Newton was one of the many students at Cambridge University who were sent home on account of the plague. In his spare time, Newton developed what we now know as calculus to solve physics problems. However, he called calculus the method of fluxions, fluxion being Newton's term for a derivative of a continuous function. Newton mainly used geometric proofs for his new theory, and relied on limits and concrete reality rather than concepts and theory. However, as was typical with Newton, he withheld his extraordinary findings for many years, refusing to publish them for the rest of the world. Meanwhile, young Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, a German philosopher and mathematician, began working on his calculus in 1674 while staying in Paris. On November 11th, 1675, he made a breakthrough, finding the area under the graph of the function y equals f of x. He invented a whole new system of notation for his discovery, using an elongated letter s for the Latin word summa for integration, and the d for the Latin word differentia for differentials. Leibniz published his first account of differential calculus in 1684, and then published an explanation of integral calculus in 1686. A year later, in 1687, Newton finally got around to publishing his findings, producing the Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, which has since been hailed as the greatest science book of all time. In the book, Newton described his famous laws of motion, his law of universal gravitation, and a derivation of Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Throughout the book, Newton used his new tool, calculus, to back up his physical theories. However, since Leibniz had published first, it was Leibniz, not Newton, who got sole credit for this amazing new field of mathematics. In retrospect, both men's calculus work had problems. Newton's calculus lacked a standard notation and heavily relied on geometric proofs of infinitesimals. Leibniz and Newton both based their work on this concept. Infinitesimals were quantities that were not zero, yet smaller in absolute value than any real number. They were necessary because the concept of the limit had not yet been invented, so without infinitesimals there was no way to properly study a continuous function. Unfortunately, infinitesimals were on shaky philosophical and mathematical ground, and many refused to accept a calculus based on these infirm ideas. But back to Newton. Determined to prove that he was the sole inventor of calculus, Newton embarked on a 17th century smear campaign to prove that Leibniz had plagiarized. 
Fortunately for Newton, there was plenty of circumstantial evidence in his favor. Many of Newton's colleagues had connections to Leibniz, and some of Newton's unpublished manuscripts may have found their way into Leibniz's hands. Newton and Leibniz had also corresponded by letter quite frequently, sharing ideas about mathematics. In fact, Newton's first descriptions of calculus, including the binomial theorem, fluxions, and tangents, first appeared in letters he wrote to Leibniz. Newton also had powerful allies working in his favor. Following his publication of the Principia Mathematica, Newton became something of a scientific celebrity, winning the support of the prestigious British Royal Society, which would become his main attack dog on Leibniz. Unfortunately, in contrast to Newton's popularity, Leibniz had few allies. When his friend, mathematician Johann Bernoulli, tried to defend Leibniz's credibility in a letter to Newton, Newton pressured Bernoulli into retracting his statements. Nearing the end of his life, Leibniz gradually lost control of the argument, and Newton became known as the father of calculus. In 1715, the Royal Society officially proclaimed Sir Isaac Newton as the sole discoverer of calculus. Leibniz died only a year later, having lost much of his credibility. Even after his death, Newton and the Royal Society worked to discredit Leibniz. They claimed that Leibniz's different notation was just a mask for his treachery, despite the fact that it was actually more efficient than Newton's dot notation. However, in spite of the rulings of the Royal Society, mathematics in the rest of Europe continued from where Leibniz had left off. Newton's fluxional calculus was discarded in favor of Leibniz's methods, which were more efficient and applicable. However, as a matter of national pride, England refused to use Leibniz's methods, sticking to Newton's outdated method of fluxions. As a result, while the mathematics of continental Europe advanced, British mathematics languished. It was only until 1820 that Britain finally recognized the work of foreign mathematicians, and the march of mathematical progress could continue. Only the passage of time has revealed the true answer to the calculus controversy. After careful analysis of both scientists' papers, most historians have come to the conclusion that both Newton and Leibniz invented calculus independently. Though, as Newton claimed, Leibniz had indeed seen some early manuscripts of the Principia, by this time he had already come to his own conclusions. Both men had collaborated by letters in developing concepts like the power series and had known of each other's progress. Further analysis of both men's methods has provided more evidence. Newton, who had used calculus as a tool for physics, had approached calculus from the derivative as applied to motion and velocity. On the other hand, Leibniz had taken a geometrical approach, basing his discoveries on the work of previous thinkers like Descartes and Pascal. This is perhaps the most conclusive evidence that both Newton and Leibniz were independent inventors of calculus. While modern controversies are so often about celebrity divorces or boys in balloons, the fact that the best remembered controversy of the 17th century was about the invention of an advanced mathematical field speaks volumes. In spite of all the hubbub about who invented what and when, both Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz are perhaps best remembered as pioneers of mathematics, adventurers who pushed the limits of human comprehension to new frontiers. For that, both men deserve the utmost credit. Dun, dun, dun. All right. Isn't that a nice story of how one of the greatest innovations in math ever happened? So, who said math is boring? It's very interesting if you know the history of math as well as how we, uh, what are the big ideas, what is really, so we're going to talk about what is calculus, but uh, it, the controversy is like this, whether Tartaglia versus Cardano that we looked at earlier for algebra, uh, Newton versus Leibniz, these caught the attention of the public because these are public debates, the people actually witnessed, it. that's how math and science became so popular uh, in Europe uh, from probably around 16th century to 20th ongoing uh, led to a lot of innovations. But what really is calculus? If you watch the video, there are two parts to calculus, right? How many, anybody remembers what were the two side, two calculus, two parts of the calculus that you talked about? It's a bit hard for you, so, uh, because first time probably are here. The two parts to calculus, let me draw this. Called one is called the differential calculus, and again, you are too and to really able to solve this. That's not my goal here. My goal is that appreciate you can actually understand the central idea behind what is calculus, what is differential calculus, what is integral calculus without really going to the details, which you will learn. But most kids will learn it only in college. 
and, and markets like you probably will do it in high school as advanced courses like course, uh, advanced placement courses, etc. Um, but even at this age, you will be able to appreciate what what is the central idea behind that, and that's really my goal here. So one is differential calculus, the other is called integral calculus. So what is the central idea behind differential calculus and what is the central idea behind integral calculus? So we talk, yes? Sure. So we learned uh, in the first class, we did the math of soccer ball, right? In the spirit of the World Cup soccer. Today, we are going to play baseball. We are going to learn the math of baseball. Okay? Everyone knows this baseball, right? Yeah. So, huh? A little bit? Yeah. Okay. So, look what I'm doing. I'm going to throw this ball. Okay? Pass. Hmm? Pass. Pass? Yeah. Well, I'll pass later, but uh, watch, watch as I throw this ball. It's hmm? only cricket style. Hmm? Cricket style, okay. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to throw like a uh, baseball type, although uh, you can apply the same principle for that. But as I throw this, okay, when I throw the ball, when it is in my hand, observe this one more time carefully. Where is it? Where is it in my, my hand here? What is its speed? Zero, no speed, right? But when I throw it, I gave it a speed because I, I pushed based on Newton's law of motion, right? I gave you some force and it got some speed. And as I threw this, it followed a path. My, I have two questions. The first question is, can you describe the path that the ball took? Mathematically, as I throw it, can you describe the path? And two, and what I mean by path is, mathematically, can you tell me what is the position of the ball at every point in the path? Mathematically, that is one. And two, can you tell me the speed of the ball at every point, at in, every individual point, mathematically? Mm -hmm. Okay, I throw it one more time. Watch this. So, at every point in the path, can you tell its position of the ball in the path and the speed of the path? 10 miles per hour. <laughs> okay, good guess. Okay. But uh, I don't even want a number. My question really is. Uh, mathematically, how can you find it? Now, mathematicians found that to find the position at, at, of the ball anywhere, we can actually algebra can help us do that because algebra helps us finding unknowns. And the position is initially unknown, but I can describe it in unknowns like an x as a variable, right? Or x or y. So, when the ball is in my hand here, Okay. Before I throw, I can I can tell its position with two things. I can say that let's say it's uh, uh, five feet or six feet. Let's say five feet from the ground. Okay. We can call this whatever uh, y value. Okay. It's also kind of, I can tell that it's probably let's say twenty feet from the wall. So it's a five feet from the ground and twenty feet from the wall. That is one way to mathematically tell its position. But when I throw this. At every point, I can tell how, what is its height from the ground as well as what is its from the, uh, distance from the wall, right? At every point, I can do that. And then I can come up with an equation. Uh, for every, if I represent it as a variable as a time, at zero seconds, at zero time, its position is 5 feet from ground and 20 feet from the wall. At 0.1 second, where is it? What is 0.2 seconds? Where is it? What? One second? Where is it? Two seconds? Where it is it? After 10 seconds? Where is it? I can tell. We can describe algebraically, right? Don't worry about the equation right now. Uh, that you will figure out when you go to middle school, uh, later middle school and high school. But you can algebra will help us do that. But how will you find the speed? What is really speed? Okay, most of you knew that. Uh, some of you probably know that. Uh, we can say speed is equal to distance over time, right? Probably some of because speed is called also rate. And what is it? Rate means it's a rate of change. When the ball moves from one point to another point, okay, its position has changed. The rate of change of the position or the place is called the speed. Okay, mathematically, or physically, in, in scientifically speaking. Uh, 
and if you don't understand all that, that's okay. You, you have time to understand. I just want to give you a general picture, big picture, okay? To find that speed, the, ch the rate of change, or to find the speed at any point is called the instantaneous rate of change. Because we know what is rate of change. When it goes from here to here, its position moved, whatever, uh, 5 inches, like let's say 2 inches vertically and 3 inches horizontally in 1 second, let's say. And based on that, we can find what is the speed, average speed from here to here, right? But what we are really interested in is speed exactly at this point. That is called an instantaneous change. Okay? Or take this ball. Okay? It's a kind of bouncy ball, squishy ball. Okay? As I throw this ball, okay? At this point, its position I can tell is set, right? Uh, and what is its speed? Zero. Zero, right? It's not moving. Speed is equal to, only when it's moving, it has a speed. It has no speed. It is the rate of change is zero because it's not changing at all. There is no question of rate of change when you are not changing it. But once I release it, because of gravity, it goes down, right? And as it goes down, what is happening to its position? The height is reducing, but the speed is increasing, right? And as when it hits the ground, what is its position? Zero from the zero height from the ground. But its speed is also the maximum at that point. But as soon as it hits the ground, it becomes zero speed. Because the ground has stopped it and then it bounces back, then it, it gains the speed again, right? So at any point, we can tell the position using the algebra that if we call the height as x, I can say that x is equal to what our x speed from at every, every second we can tell. That. But to find the speed or the speed at any point called instantaneous change or instantaneous rate of change, we can calculate using differential calculus. That's what a differential calculus is. It helps us find rate of change. It helps us find the speed in this case. Another easier example. Okay. Um, how many of you saw a film, uh, a video film where at each, and some of you might have seen in the, in the cartoons or in the movies or the videos. Sure. Uh, as from, you might have seen a film, some, it looks somewhat like this, like a reel of film. Right? A reel of film, okay, Pranay, look here. Each frame, there will be multiple, with, with holes at the top and bottom. Have you seen any of them in the cartoons or the movies or videos? Right? And there will be a picture, it's called negative. You can't see the picture clearly, but it's kind of negative. The, the ones with the light will look as black and other, uh, the ones without light look as uh, white. They're called negatives. But if you look from frame to frame, film to film, they look almost identical. There's not much difference. Okay, but first to second, or second to third, or third to fourth, they almost look similar. But if you take the one first frame with the hundredth frame, they have changed. Right? Similarly, so if I'm moving in slow motion, my, my hand is like this, okay? And if I move this, right, the, the first frame is like this, second frame is almost a little bit changed, but you can't see it. Slowly moving, okay? Each of the movements is captured in one film, in one frame, in the film. Because when we run the frame fast enough, today's digital cameras we don't see that. In the old days when you have physical film with that stored, right? So you have to store each of the positions in a different frame. And when you run it fast enough at more than 22 frames per second, it's called our eye cannot differentiate. That, that it, it's actually you're moving it slowly. It thinks it is a continuous motion. In reality, the film is not continuous, right? Each each picture is captured separately in a separate in a separate frame. But when you run it fast enough, it looks as if my hand is moving freely. But in reality, when they put it in the film, it's not continuous. It's actually discontinuous. Every frame is different from the other. But from one to other, the difference is so little that you can't always you can't see them. That change. A little, little change is called instantaneous change. Another example is if you look at uh, from one moment to next moment, okay? Can you tell if you, your height has grown from this moment to next second? Okay? From one hour to next hour, can you tell if your height has grown? Okay? From today to tomorrow, can you tell if the height has changed? Possibly. Really? Possibly. No. Mm. You can think conceptually, but it's, yeah. 
did you ever see someone tell you, oh, from yesterday to today you grew? I can see yeah. that. No, right? But let's say you did not see your some your relative or friend, your your cousin or uncle for two three years, and I said, wow, you grew in last two years. Did you hear that? That's so common comment, right? Mm -hmm. What is if do you think you, you really grew at the end of two years by two inches suddenly? No. Mm -hmm. Do you think you grew uh, maybe at the end of each year by one inch each? Yeah. Suddenly, you oh, did not grow no. for the whole year by inch. No. No. Uh, do you think at the end of each month you grew a little bit? Yeah. You did not grow for the whole month, but at the end of the month you grew a little bit? Mm -hmm. No. Do you think at the end of, when you sleep every night, you don't grow for the whole day, but maybe when you sleep, you grow a little bit by one millimeter? No. No. The growth is actually continuous. You are growing every second, every moment. Although, it is so small that nobody can see it. Right? Another example. Uh, if you look at your backyards, uh, the grass. Can you see from moment to moment the grass growing? No. Can you see even from hour to hour? No. But your dad or mom or someone, or maybe someone from outside, they have to mow, mow the lawn every, uh, every couple of weeks, right? Why, Why do you think so? Huh? Not weeks. Maybe, maybe a month. Yeah. Okay? okay? But within a couple of weeks, can you see that it, it's grown from a small to it's grown a little bit? Mm -hmm. In a couple of weeks or a month, you can see the difference, right? Mm -hmm. But do you think it's just growing at the end of each week by, by suddenly one inch? No, it's continuously oh. growing. So that is the key concept behind differential compass. That the rate of change is continuous, but you, it is difficult to tell continuously how much you have grown. So we use discontinuous. We say, oh, from this moment, in the next one hour, one, one day, it grew by this much. But in reality, the growth is continuous. Okay? So differential cal calculus helps us find what we call instantaneous change. The change that is happening in within an instant, all in solid. Okay? <coughs> so if I draw the path of this curve when I threw, when I threw the uh, baseball, right? So if I threw from the ground, let's say something like this. By the way, there's a name for this curve. Anybody knows what is the name of this curve? When you throw a ball, the path it follows, yes? Parabola. Parabola. Awesome. It's called parabola. Okay, it is not a circle. Although it might look like a semicircle, it's not. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different shape. That is the path it takes. Now the question is, from this point to somewhere close by, if you want to find, uh, well, I want to, what you really want to find is what is the speed at any point. At this point, what is the speed? But it is difficult to find the speed at that point because the change can only observe from one point. From here to here, if I want to find, let's call this call point is A and this point is B. If we want to find what is the speed between these two, we can apply the principle that we know. We can find what is the distance between them. And we can also find what is the time it took. And we said speed is defined as rate of change. Right? Rate of change of the position. So that, that is distance, this distance D divided by time will give us the speed, average speed from this point to this point. That is fairly obvious using our algebra also. But if I want to find what is the speed at A itself, that is a harder point. So to do that, what mathematicians like Newton and Maverick, but as I said, it actually started all the way back by, you saw that some of the Indian mathematicians, but uh, Archimedes, uh, more than 2000 years back, when he came very close to calc inventing calculus, although using those days, methods it was, he did not reach the final step. But to find that, what they did was, try to make it small enough so that you can find uh, the rate of change at that. But don't worry about too much about how exactly do that. But that's essentially what differential calculus did. It helps us find the little change of the grass at any moment, or the little change in our height at any time, or the little change in the position of the ball, or the little change in the, in the position of this ball, to calculate the speed at any time, okay? And that little thought is so important for mathematics and science and economics today that without that we cannot do advanced math. Now, I took this example, but you can apply it to any change, okay? And that, that's how uh, uh, today's engineering and technology works. What is integral calculus? 
integral calculus again at a high level it is like a opposite side if you take addition and subtraction they are kind of inverses of each other right they are like two sides of the coin if you take multiplication and division they are like inverses of each other differential calculus and integral calculus are kind of inverses of each other they are like two sides of a coin and the, what integral calculus does is if you take this same curve what is the area under the curve And it's hard to find the area under a curve. It's easy to find area of a rectangle or a square or a triangle, right? But under a curve, it's a little bit hard, and it's not even a circle. Even circle was hard, but remember we talked about how Archimedes found the circumference. Similarly, he actually found the area of a circle as well. He actually found the area of a uh, parabola, and that's how we came close to inventing calculus. He even found the volume of three-dimensional pictures like three-dimensional objects such as uh, spheres and cylinders. Okay? But today, to find the uh, area of under a curve or the volume of a three-dimensional object, etc., uh, integral calculus is used. These two, the instant, one way to look at it is, in differential calculus, we're taking the big chain and trying to find what is a small change, instantaneous change. Okay? In co integral calculus, we are doing the opposite. We are taking the big picture, okay, and we are we are taking actually we break, break them into small pieces and try to find what is the area of each one because that looks like a rectangle almost, right? But then you add all of them, you add all the areas, okay, you get the total area. That's why Leibniz used S for summa. You remember he mentioned mentioned summa in uh, Latin summa means total addition. So that's why you use the symbol S to show integration. For call, for a differential, you use D, which meant for difference. So this is like a difference, this is like addition. At a high level, integral calculus is like, add all these small things to find the total area. That's why it's called a, uh, usually symbol, like a long symbol. Whereas for a differential calculus, they use the symbol dx by dy. But don't worry about how to do all that. You will learn, you have a lot of time to learn this, but next time when calculus comes, don't get scared. That's all that we are trying to find. Okay? Yes, Sri. But isn't that basically um, the dx by dy, x by y? Because if d over d is 1, right? Yeah, but you are not multiplying dx by dy. D, and d is not separate. dx essentially is one thing that shows the small difference in x and small difference in y. So it's not d times x. dx really is one thing that shows that the small change in x divided by small change in y. That's why you can divide d and d. Okay? Uh, so be ready when it comes. Be curious because this, this is probably the most powerful math technique ever invented. Without this, we will not have all the advanced technology today. We will not have all the advanced lights, or, you know, your cars, engines, motors, and uh, most of the technology that we use. It's not possible without different, the calculus. Okay? And as you learn this, when you go to any field of uh, science, it will be very useful. Or even economics. Over there. Okay? Um, Alright. So that brings me to the uh, the third math topic, uh, probably third greatest math innovation ever. Now, remember we talked about uh, the interesting figure Cardano? Uh, I said he's going to come back in a different one, okay? Um, here, if this time, after he published the, the book with Cardano's secret, uh, sorry, Tartaglia's secret, now it's a, he made money from the book, but now he can't, not only Tartaglia can't use, Cardano can't use it either, either to, to win the contest, right? It's public, everybody knows. He found a new thing. And this time he moved to gambling. Anybody knows what is gambling? Yes. Yeah. It's like uh, the easiest way to look is <coughs> dice. In, the, in those days, playing with dice was very popular. Yeah, yeah. When you throw the dice, right, but 
they tell the different people standing at the table, they say, okay, it's going to be, let's say you just throw one die. And, and in a die, there are one, two, three, four, five, six sides, right? Six numbers. If you, they'll say, okay, if it comes three, I'll, you'll get this much money. If you, get, if you don't get that, you lose this much money, okay? And it's almost like a chance, right? And that's why it's called gambling, because you cannot tell what's going to come, and, uh, and hence, it's, uh, uh, it's like you're taking chances, you do, cannot predict what's going to come. But Cardano found uh, something interesting for the first time in the history of math. That, uh, he found that in spite of not knowing what is going to come next, he figured out a way to find what we call as probability today. Right. What is the probability that a particular number can come? And based on that, he killed, he started making a lot of money because he knew something that nobody else knew. And there's the same thing about all your cubic equations by making money by knowing something that you don't, others don't know. This time, by knowing how to, although we cannot tell for certain what is going to come next, we can tell what is the probability that something can come. And there's some probability, and when you throw two, two dice instead of one die, you can tell what is the probability that one one will come versus one two will come together. Okay, and using that he started betting based using mathematics, and he started making money. And but what he did not realize is that by doing that he invented or he was a pioneer in inventing a, a completely new field of mathematics. And uh, so let's watch the next video to see how this started a whole new revolution in uh, the third video. Whole new revolution in mathematics that today most advanced uh, stock markets, financial markets, business are based on this. Okay, let's watch this. Chip in seven years is almost his. All of these games are structured worlds with well-defined rules. Each involves strategies and potential payoffs. When we put money on games, the outcome affects us. Therefore, we care about the odds. The understanding of odds or chance leads to probability theory. The founding father of this subject had a serious stake in understanding the outcome of a game of dice. Cardano was an Italian mathematician with a well-known gambling addiction. He wrote letters in which he bragged about his ability to beat his friends. His trick was to place his bets using his ideas from mathematics. His breakthrough was a method of calculating the certainty or probability of some random event, such as rolling snake eyes. Let's pause for a moment and think about the physics of dice. There are two reasons why a dice roll is unpredictable or random. The first is symmetry. Dice are designed to be symmetrical, unlike an egg, which is asymmetrical, always falling predictably onto its broad side. Dice are balanced so they do not favor a side. The second is mixture. Each time we roll a dice, tiny changes in the initial position and velocity of the dice are amplified as it bounces along its path. The unpredictability comes from not knowing the exact initial speed, position, and direction of the toss. This results in a powerful property Cardano noticed. Every outcome is equally likely. This allowed him to calculate the probability by developing what's now called a probability space. First, he counts all the possible outcomes. Then he defines the event in question, such as rolling a 1, which can occur in one way. The probability is then found by dividing the event by all possible events, which in this case works out to 1 6. Realize the cold calculating logic here. There is no such thing as a lucky number, no divine intervention. The probability of rolling any number is exactly 1 6. The same logic applies when we roll multiple dice. Imagine he needed to know the probability of rolling a pair, such as snake eyes. First, he counts the size of the sample space. 
With two dice rolls, there are 36 possible outcomes. Six times six. Then he counts the number of ways you can roll a pair. There are six different pairs. So, six divided by 36 is the probability of rolling a pair. Also, one six. This simple yet powerful idea allowed Cardano to bet according to the true odds, while his opponents place their bets based on hunches and lucky numbers. Remember, this works with multiple tosses. Imagine we needed to know the odds of rolling three ones. Simple. First, we figure out the size of the sample space. For three dice, this is six times six times six, or 216. There is only one way to roll three ones. So the probability is 1 divided by 216. <coughs> this was the trick. It was not based on magic, but mathematics. Years later, two more Italians, Pascal... Alright, so uh, that, what Cardano started with uh, make money in gambling. A lot of people are doing gambling, throwing dice and trying to predict what is the outcome. But everybody else was using lucky numbers. Oh, I want two this time, or based on what they think, hunches. But he was the first and only one at the time to use math to call, see what is the probability that a particular total number will come as opposed to others. And using that, he was beating others. Although nobody can tell, including him, right, what is uh, the probability that uh, what is going to come next? If you throw two dice, you can get anywhere from two to how much? Twelve, right? You get one and one is two. Six and six is twelve, and there are other numbers possible. What number going, can come when you throw two dice? Everybody thought you cannot tell, and you cannot tell for sure. But what you can tell is that there are more chances of one compared to the other, one total compared to the other total. Using that. He was putting, started putting bets and he was making money. But in the process, <coughs> he invented this new theory of probability. Now, interestingly, probability was the last uh, between algebra and calculus and probability was invented much later than even calculus. But although probably calculus, in, Intellectually speaking, you know, abstractly speaking, calculus is much harder. Even algebra, calculus is harder. But calculus, the reason why probability probably took so long is because of one of, uh, going back to the ancient Greeks, their bias against anything that is not certain. So one of the things that they said, well, and because it great, all the Western thought, European thought, where all the modern science and math really developed, uh, starting 15, 16, 17 centuries, uh, they followed the Greek and Roman thoughts. And the Greeks always said, in math and science, things have to be certain. One plus one is always two. You cannot say, if you, if you say that I am not sure, then it's not science, it's not math, it's not knowledge. So the knowledge of math or the knowledge of science is always certain. It has one plus one is always two. If you have anything that is not certain, then that is not knowledge, that is not math, that is not science. If you throw your dice, if you, because we can't tell what is the next number, it, there is no science behind it. Okay? And because of that, all the Western thought actually did not go in the direction. They only looked at what is certain, determinatistic. But, but many others, especially in the East, uh, uh, India, China, Arabic, we talked about there several thoughts but it never really matured until Cardano inadvertently without thinking about the math impact probably he is a mathematician as we have seen that he understood cubic equations right he published a book on that he figured this math and using that he was winning um, and he also actually wrote a book which is probably the first known book on probability what we call as probability today uh, and it's twin subject of statistics, probability and statistics go together. Uh, although there were references in a very old Indian uh, books, like Mahabharata has reference to how certain people, you might have heard of Shakuni is an expert in dice, 
if you if you listen to uh, any or watch any Mahabharata episodes, or uh, there is a reference to another uh, king called Rutuparna, which is, who is even before Pandavas and Kauravas who were part of the uh, Mahabharata, but it is part of Mahabharata story. It goes back in history a little bit before that. He uses statistics. It was the it was the first known reference to use of statistics uh, in any ancient books. But it did not really develop into further science, which happened only in the uh, you know, in the last four five hundred years in Europe. But after Cardano, the two great mathematicians uh, who are more respected mathematicians, but developed it further using a series of letters to each other. Their names were Blaise Pascal, Blaise Pascal, and. Uh, Pierre de Fermat. They're both very interesting figures. Uh, perhaps you, the first one, Pascal, you might have heard. Anybody heard Pascal triangle? Triangle that looks like one, 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 uh, one, two, one, one, three, three, one. Yeah, it's called Pascal triangle. It has a lot of interesting properties with it. Okay, if you have not, go and ask your parents or check this out. It's a very interesting triangle. Pascal was not the first to invent it; he's the one who popularized it. Uh, so some of you might have heard this is the same Pascal and Fermat. They're both French. That's why their names sound again like a Descartes' name. Like they, pro they pronounce different from <coughs> Fermat, the T side. We are going to talk about him more in the next class. In the next called Fermat's last theorem. Uh, it was one of the most intriguing math problems ever. Uh, but these two gentlemen spent more time developing the theory of probability. Again, as, a, as interested in gambling, they were also interested in gambling. They were probably also taking trying to make money out of it uh, by betting correctly, uh, which others don't know. But in the process, they advanced in the field of probability which later was picked up by another uh, Swiss mathematician called Johannes uh, uh, Bernoulli, who was actually briefly referred when you guys watched the calculus controversy between uh, Newton and Leibniz. He talked about uh, Johannes Bernoulli is one of the few people who actually uh, supported uh, Leibniz when nobody was supporting him, everybody else was supporting uh, Newton. But Bernoulli family was one of the greatest mathematical uh, families. There are probably three or four generations of mathematicians. Father, son, uh, grandson, the great grandson, they all worked on different fields of mathematics. And he was the first probably uh, mathematician to write a probability, book on probability, that is not related to gambling, but for business and general decision making. And, uh, but from that point, many mathematicians developed. Today, Probability and statistics are, we cannot live uh, without them because they are used everywhere. In fact, they're pro in a day to day life, if you look at, if you open a newspaper, right, they are used much more often compared to algebra or calculus because statistics is there everywhere. If you put your graphs and charts, they are all statistics. If you look at a whole financial market or a stock market, it is heavily based on statistics and probability and how companies invest money uh, even in a business or even simple decision making sometimes you know, what car to buy where to buy the house all those are based we intuitively use this all the time uh, if you look at elections right oftentimes when elections happen newspapers and uh, news channels predict who's going to win okay. Sorry. Yep. good so, yeah, good. I think we took us somewhere. Uh, we're almost done uh, in the last commission. Uh, so, do correct this uh, work. Okay. And uh, if you miss anything, watch the video later. Okay. So, uh, today we cannot live without this. This is part of everyday life. Elections we talked about, right? You newspapers and news channels are going to predict in advance before the elections are over who's, going, who, who's likely to win. And oftentimes they're right using statistics. So these are very important fields today, day to day life. And you are going to probably again, you start learning the, uh, the simple probability 
uh, and simple statistics probably in middle school but we go to high school more advanced ones and uh, uh, so algebra calculus and probability that we talked about are three of the probably greatest innovations ever happened in math it's they, were, they did not come naturally it is that oh everybody used it from the beginning probably numbers were the simple numbers arithmetic ones twos adding them they are the first to start the, the geometry was also a little bit intuitive right the pictures people can understand but when it comes to algebra it's a I will call, I call it an invention, not a discovery, because it's the way it came out is people said, oh, let's do this way, calculus or probability, but uh, and they're they're essential not just for science and mathematics, but day to day life, I mean, statistics and probability are used everywhere. But uh, so my goal here is that is not that you're going to you know, understand all of it and you're going to solve uh, calculus problems and from tomorrow. Don't even try that, but uh, because you are several years away from that. But what is important is that the essential idea behind all of them is day-to-day -day life. How the grass grows, that like like we talked about, is the is actually you can relate it to the differential calculus. In fact, one of your projects today uh, for this week is that. Okay, uh, so I want you to appreciate a little bit of all of this we learned in a day-to-day -day thing. When next time you observe that, oh, this is actually probability, I can actually predict based on probability. Or uh, I can actually see the a little differential calculus in the grass that is growing, or the films, or the baseball uh, that we threw, right? And algebra, you're probably going to learn pretty soon, and some of you might have started learning. But, but appreciate, and don't get scared by this, okay? Uh, and remember the great stories behind them, uh, and that probably will motivate you to learn this better okay any questions if not uh, we're going to close today